So uh, welcome to our first public lecture of 2016 and also our summer public lecture. We're very uh, delighted to introduce you to Dr. Bob Bentley from Mallard Space Science Laboratory at the University of College London in the UK, who is spending a week with us, two weeks with us actually, here in, in Armanus, um, working on a, a very interesting project, which I'll tell you a little bit in a moment, about in a moment. Uh, Dr. Bentley has a PhD in solar physics. He is, as I mentioned, currently working for the Mallard Space Science Laboratory, uh, which is a department of the University of College London. Um, uh, Dr. Winkley has been involved in space weather and the impacts of space weather since, since before we actually made space weather such a global phenomenon and a well-known name. Uh, we were trying to work it out earlier today, and he was saying to me that um, he remembers working on space weather before it was known as space weather. So that was around about the mid-1990s, when space weather became known firstly in the U.S., as a phenomenon that impacts our technology and something that we should take uh, cognizance of. Um, since that time, Dr. Bentley has been involved in a lot of different um, space weather projects, mostly around aviation and the impacts on airlines. In particular, uh, a very early project in the mid-2000s was sponsored by ISA. ISA were looking at different kinds of space weather projects that would um, show the risk that space weather had. And he worked on one called SOARS, which was um, stood for Space Weather Operational Airlines Risk Service. It was also one of the first international projects that had an airline as a partner. Virgin Atlantic was a partner to that project. So that was really good. Since then, he's been on various projects, including two virtual observatory FP7 European Union projects, which looked at using, utilizing the space weather data as well as providing service for operations and also good science and space weather research. At the moment, the um, reason why Dr. Bentley has come to South Africa at this time to visit us is that SANSA is a partner in an international uh, space partnership project, <coughs> which is funded by the UK Space Agency and consists of four UK institutions, SANSA and one US institution. And basically, we have got together to look at the economic benefits of space weather. Can we put a value onto it? Is space weather impacts us and we lose our power grid for a month or we lose airline services, what does that cost the country? And um, we want to put values onto that. And so we've joined forces to come up with that project. Um, last year, there were three of us that spent up to six weeks in the UK. And this year, between January and April, we will host approximately eight UK visitors onto this project, all looking at different aspects um, of that side of things. So under that project, and funded by the UK Space Agency, Dr. Denke has spent two weeks with us. As I mentioned, his speciality is aviation, and Sansa is very interested and has just started a new project on the space with the impacts on the aviation sector over Africa. So we are very interested in what we can learn from him and the utilization of his experience. And so we, we twisted his arm <laughs> to give a public lecture tonight <laughs> because this is a topic that interests us and it's also something different, and it's not often we have an expert of his caliber with us. So we would like to share his expertise with you. So without further ado, Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you feel the same at the end. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about um, space weather and the aviation, civil aviation. Uh, I'm going to start off by explaining what space weather is. I mean, I don't know how many people in the audience really know about space weather, so I'll talk about uh, space weather, what it, how it affects the Earth, how the sun is the driving force of it, and then I'll start talking about aviation, how operations are done, and then the impacts that you get on aviation. So you're probably familiar with this big yellow thing, it's certainly more familiar than we are. In England, we don't see it very often. <laughs> so this here is a sunspot, and you've probably heard of the sun, you've probably heard of the sunspots. Sunspots uh, are uh, an indication that the sun is active. They're actually uh, ropes of magnetic flux emerging through the surface, and the reason that they appear dark is because they're actually slightly cooler material 
and therefore they appear dark on the surface. The sun rotates every 27 days, and each day you'll see these things marching across. And so I say it takes 14 days to go from one side to the other. So there's one sunspot group there, another big sunspot group there, odd little things around here. Now, this is at a temperature of about four or 5,000 degrees, the photosphere. If you look in different wavelengths, and so here we're looking in the near infrared, a line that's called hydrogen alpha, you're now looking at a slightly higher part of the solar atmosphere. Your sunspots aren't quite so visible. Some of them, you can see there's one here, it's quite visible. That one, the ones here are not quite so visible because uh, there's a bit of activity going on. But you can see many other features, including this dark feature here, which is called a filament, which is where material is actually held up in the atmosphere by magnetic structure. And then notice this double V-shaped bright feature down here, because when I move up to another wavelength, and this is in the extreme ultraviolet, I should mention that all of these, these images are taken at the same time. When I move into, up into another wavelength, then you note that suddenly you see a lot of loop structures. And this is actually showing that, although you can't see it to the naked eye, what you see the sun is this yellow thing. But when you look in the extreme ultraviolet, then you see all of this loop structure. And this filament that we saw back here is just there. When you look in the extreme ultraviolet, it actually extends further. And this double V structure here when you look in the extreme ultraviolet, is actually an arcade of loops. As the loops, where the loops come down into the photosphere, then you're getting bright ribbons. You're getting bright ribbons. This is actually called a two-ribbon flare. It's a very, very large flare. Now we're up in the, into the corona, and the temperature here is sort of a million degrees and above. So if you now want to say, what is this all caused by? As I said, magnetic field. So here you see the loops caused by, which are the emerging flux coming out through the surface, looping back. And you, you've basically got a polarity, different polarities. You'll find that loops, the different parts of the structure, some parts are in a negative polarity, some parts are in a positive polarity. And you get this very, very nice sort of structure. If we now look at a slightly different day, there's another feature here which I haven't mentioned yet. This is called a coronal hole. This is where the magnetic field is actually open and therefore appears darker because there's no bright material being contained in the loops. Again, you can see various uh, fantastic loop structures here. If we take what are called difference images, and what we're doing here is taking uh, one image subtracting the previous image so you can see what changes have taken place. And in fact, we're doing this in three different wavelengths in the extreme ultraviolet, which are looking at slightly different temperatures. Then you find that when a flare goes off, its effect is not confined to where the flare site is. It's created a shock wave here, which has gone all the way across the sun. Now, on this scale, the sun, the earth, you can fit 110 earths across the diameter of the sun. So you can see the scale of this structure is enormous and it, it, it goes all the way across the sun. When a flare goes off, it emits certain types of, uh, it creates certain types of emission. The things we worry about are x-rays and particles there are also other things coming out, and I'll get onto those in a moment. Another event here, again, a flare. Now, this one was very unusual as to how much material is actually then curling over and falling back onto the surface again. You can see it dropping down in various parts coming down. I, I had an email from somebody at NASA about this event, and his official description was, this one will knock your socks off. <laughs> and it is very, very spectacular. I mean, you don't get many quite like that. But this is an example of what's called a coronal mass ejection. And in a coronal mass ejection, you get a mass of material emitted from the sun. Embedded in the material is actually some magnetic field. And this then moves out through the solar system, depending on exactly where 
you are where things are happening, then you may or not be affected. We know it's been emitted from the sun because we can use another instrument. This is called a coronagraph. And what a coronagraph does is to create an artificial eclipse. It puts a small disk over the bright part of the sun so that the bright part of the sun is obscured. And then you can see features in the corona stretching out. So the solar disk is in here. It's stretching out and you can see various, these are called streamers. And then that is a coronal mass ejection where you get this mass of material coming out. Now I stopped the movie early there just to, so I could explain what a coronal mass ejection was. But if I actually play the movie again and let it run a little bit further, this particular coronal mass ejection was also accompanied by energetic particles. The energetic particles basically have traveled all the way to the spacecraft that's making the observations. And you can see the particles actually crossing the CCD, the camera part, the detecting part of the camera, crossing the camera. And so this snow is an indication that you've had an energetic particle event. These all look very pretty, but what you've got to understand is how things relate to each other. This is a sort of diagram to try and explain things. So the sun at the top, normal photons coming out from the sun will take a direct path to the Earth, and they take about eight minutes. If you've got energetic particles, these particles are charged, they have to follow uh, the magnetic field that's coming out of the sun, and it, this is actually a spiral path. So these take about eight minutes. The particles will take tens of minutes to get here. You've also got uh, a solar wind, which is a general outflow of material from the sun, which is moving instead of um, speed of light, near speed of light, that's just moving at a few hundred kilometers per second. So that will typically take several days to get here. And on top of that, you have these coronal mass ejections, which are these masses of material that's come rushing out. The fastest CME that's been recorded got here in just over 17 hours. So, you know, that's 2,000, 3,000 kilometers per second this material is traveling at. And at the shock front of the CME, then you get more particles created. And so you can get energetic particles coming from the site on the of the flare on the sun. And you can also get them from the shock front of the CME. The two have got slightly different signatures. These tend to occur at the start of the event. These last much longer. These can go on for days. That probably only lasts for a t few tens of minutes to an hour. If you step back a little bit further, this is a diagram of the solar system out to the orbit of um, two astronomical units, or twice the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And you can see the Sun, Venus, Earth, Mars, the spiral is the spiral of the magnetic field. The red is indicating that part of the structure is positive polarity, the other part is negative polarity, and it's all to do how, how the shape of the, of the field is. You can see the coronal mass ejections are these big structures pushing their way through everything. So they distort this nice spiral, you know, in, we have these nice pictures of a spiral, but the reality is you've actually got a, a distorted path. So a, a particle that's coming to Earth doesn't come along a simple spiral. It's had to change, you know, it's got bent at the shock front of the CME, so it's actually following a slightly tortuous path. When this material approaches the Earth, then you've got, the Earth's got this magnetic field, which is a dipole, which is what the nice simple shape was, but the flow of the solar wind actually distorts the dipole so that it um, creates an elongated shape like that. The elongated shape persists all the time. The, the Earth actually tilts backwards and forwards as you go around the sun. This is why we have seasons, because the, the, uh, the pole is at an angle, and as you go around, you're either towards the sun or away from the sun. At the moment, you're towards the sun because it's your summer. When a coronal mass ejection arrives, 
it starts to apply pressure to the front of this system, it distorts the system and actually encourages the field lines to change shape and pinch together. When they pinch together, then you get a release of energy and electrons flow in and you get an aurora at the pole. So there you, you've sort of looked at, we've talked about flares, we've talked about energy particles, we've talked about CMEs. But if you look at the timing of these things, soft X-ray flare is the top thing, the blue. Uh, it lasts, a small flare will be a few minutes, a longer flare could be an hour or so. You get, so, get X-ray emission from that. At the same time, you start to get radio emission, basically noise. Following behind the X-rays, which are traveling at eight, uh, uh, speed of light, you've got the energetic particles. These take tens of minutes to arrive and can last for hours. So you also get some radio emission, which is related to the energetic particles. The solar wind is flowing out, but you also get this coronal mass ejection, which can take uh, anywhere, as I said, the fastest is 17 hours, but more typically they're, they're 30, 40 hours. So a CME will come out here, and you get more noise, noise associated with the arrival of this. You also get magnetic storms where you get this re reconnection in the tail of the magnetic field of the magnetosphere, where it couples back and puts particles in. Different types of emission, different time scales. And if you talk about aviation, look at the time scale here. So this is one minute, 10 minutes, one hour, <coughs> 10 hours a day, 10 days. A long haul flight can actually last into this time frame. So uh, in a, during the long haul flight, you can have had some of these effects have actually moved quite a long way from just the onset to different parts of the effect and you starting to get different things kicking in. And if you've got an active sun, of course, you may not just have one flare going off. You may have several flares going off one every hour or so, or more than one an hour. So you can have many of these things folded up. So you're getting many types of emission all folding on top of each other. Now, you remember I was talking about the sunspots. The sunspots have been observed since the telescope was invented. So the first observations were made by Galileo back in the 1600s. And we've been observing the sunspot cycle ever since. And the sunspot cycle is basically going up and down every 11 years. There was a patch here shortly after the telescope was invented where there was very few sunspots. And this was called the Monde Minimum. We don't think sunspots entirely disappeared. We just think that they were hard to see. But basically you can see the cyclic nature. Now it means that we can, we can tell when there's likely to be periods of high activity. And all of the effects I've been talking about, the uh, occurrence of flares, the occurrence of CMEs, and to an extent the occurrence of particle events, follow this sort of structure so that you get many more at solar maximum and get far fewer at solar minimum. The solar cycle that we're just in at the moment had an abnormally long minimum. Sorry, this only goes up to 2000, but with the, the one that's at the moment has an abnormally long minimum, which actually meant that, well, some people say this is why we've had a very cold winters in Europe. Back in this period is what was called a mini ice age. This is when the Thames froze over and you had frost fairs in Europe and that sort of thing they're saying that um, the same combination of circumstances are occurring again. So whether in fact we're going to get a lot of winters in the next few years, we don't know. But that's, that's the theory of some people, that um, we're on for another more minimum type event. So on to the space weather effects that are relevant. Um, as I said, the nat nature of space weather is diverse, effects are diverse as are the causes. Currently our ability to predict them is limited. Um, we're okay at saying there's a probability that they will occur, but we're uncertain about the timing of particular things like particle effects, and we're uncertain about how geo-effective a coronal mass ejection will be. The coronal mass ejection has this magnetic field embedded. Depending on the orientation of the field, as it couples to the Earth's magnetic field, it either affects, 
is geo-effective or isn't. And of course, it might not be exactly at right angles. It could be at, at angles. So we don't know how geo-effective it's going to be prior to uh, it, its arrival at what's called um, the Lagrange point one, which is about a million miles out from the Earth towards the sun, where we have a satellite stationed and you can actually measure the field at that point for the first time you actually know how geo affected the CME but that only gives you at worst 20 minutes law warning at best 40 minutes warning so you don't have a lot of time to do something when you only find out that you're going to be geo affected for that point so this limits our ability to plan responses to anticipated effects aircraft move from one location to another in the space of a few hours and some space weather effects, as I said before, can have durations which are significantly shorter than a long haul flight. So you, during the flight, you may experience different effects at different locations. Um, which effects are relevant to any particular airline really depend on its route map. Uh, we're in South Africa here, and so you will experience a completely different set of effects to British Airways being based in London because we have flights going over uh, parts of the North Atlantic and that sort of thing. So you've, it's all dependent on the routes, and I'll come more to that in future slides. The sp main effects that are relevant to space weather are the effects on radio frequency communications, and this is disruption of HF communications, and also the disruption of satellite navigation and communication systems. And then cosmic radiation, this is actually in two parts. There's a long-term variation which is related to the solar cycle and the short-term enhancements which are related to solar activity. Most of the cosmic rays that we um, observe are actually galactic cosmic rays and these are coming from all around us in the galaxy but the intensity is modified by the solar cycle. As I was saying earlier, the effects are either immediate, if things arriving are caused by the particles arriving at the speed of light or near the speed of light, or delayed, where the effects are caused by phenomena which are taking hours or days to propagate towards us. And the impact of the effects is felt on a range of timescales in different geographical areas. Talking a moment about airspace and air traffic control, when you're actually flying, you may not realize it, but you're actually going through three different domains of operation. There's the surface domain. This is when you're on the ground, and this is where your aircraft is talking to the <coughs> control tower. So when you're on the stand, when you're taxiing out to the end of the runway and as you're taking off. Once you're in the air, then you're in the terminal domain, and it's a different controller takes over and whilst you're within a few kilometer, a few tens of kilometers of the airport and maybe 10,000 feet or maybe a little bit higher, it depends on each airport has got its own set of um, circular rings around the airport which uh, say this is the profile that aircraft will follow. During this control area you will be under domain, terminal domain and then once you get further afield you're en route or if you're flying over the oceanic, you're in the oceanic domain. The air traffic control capacity is determined by your ability to move in and between domains. And so any reduction in capacity can cause delays. If you've got traffic restrictions or bottlenecks, then that's an issue. Um, bad weather and also communications. Now, traffic restrictions, you may not have the same problem here, but in Europe now, I think the airlines which are flying from one European country to another can't take off until they know that they can land at the other end. Because this is to try and avoid stacking over airports, because if you take off too quick, if you take off too soon, you arrive too soon, they can't take you, so you have to fly around in circles. So they, they wait until they are ready to receive you at the end, even though the flight may be an hour or more. Uh, bad weather, I'm sure we've all experienced um, delays call because of bad weather. Again, I had an experience where I was actually got to the end of the runway at Gatwick and they held us uh, for 30 minutes at the end of the runway because a thunderstorm moved in. They wouldn't let us take off until the thunderstorm had left. 
And so these sort of effects you're getting all, all along. On top of this, we're now talking about there are going to be some possible effects caused by space weather. And a lot of those can relate to the communication and navigation problems. Now, delays and diversions are to be avoided if, the, if there's any alternatives. It's expensive if you have a delay. I mean, the airlines do not like it, uh, particularly if they have to divert because you can end up with... Uh, you've got a problem that your aircraft are perhaps in the wrong place, your crew are in the wrong place. You may have had to divert, which means if you've, it's a planned diversion, you may have had to offload some cargo, which is revenue. And of course, there's the extra fuel costs. So if they, if they can avoid any of, any of the diversions, they will avoid them. Just to emphasize the different domains, these are, these are the things down here. Communications, when you're communicating with the aircraft, or the aircraft is communicating, when it's on the ground or in the vicinity of airports or population, it's probably communicating by VHF, which is the sort of, um, used to be used for television. It's, it's basically line of sight type or virtually line of sight type communications. As soon as you get en route, you get switch to HF communication, high frequency communications. And then you use different types of GNSS. And I'm just about to explain what this all is, but GNSS is the uh, Global Navigation Satellite System. You're probably all familiar with GPS. GPS is just a component of GNSS. And so depending on where you are in your, your flight, when you're on the ground, you're using one form of, you're probably using VHF here and then you're using HF here. As you're navigating, you're using different support systems. You've got the like GPS system, then you're having to augment it with various things which help resolve things. I'm going to go this, into this in a moment, so don't worry if you can't follow it. When you're landing, then depending on the conditions on the ground, you have to use uh, you have to have certain visibility or you can't land. If it's foggy, if the restrictions in any visibility, then you have to have support capabilities. And these are often ground-based systems which allow you to look at that. So operational planning, when you're actually flying, the airline has to create a, plan, a flight plan. This is a deliverable. They have to file the flight plan up until the point of departure, particularly for long haul flights, they will consider a number of different routes. The, the final decision, the optimal route, will be chosen very close to departure. The plan can be modified after departure, but it's in negotiation with air traffic control. This map is showing the North Atlantic with Europe here, Britain, United States and Canada. And so you can see some areas of weather that need to be concerned of, and this is actually showing there's a, a particular bad weather. I think there was there's a hurricane. But the green lines that you can see here, see here are the jet stream. Airlines operating over the North Atlantic, the tracks they will follow depend very much on the location of the, of the jet stream. If the jet stream is in one location, if it's very far north, the tracks will be north. If it's very far south, the tracks will be south. When you're traveling westwards towards the US, you're trying to avoid the, good, the strong winds. When you're traveling eastwards towards Europe, you want the strong winds. If you can get a strong tailwind from the jet stream, planes have arrived two, three hours early because they've had hundreds of kilometers per hour tailwind, which means that they travel much <coughs> faster. Now, I've, I've talked about HF communications, so I should explain what HF communications are. HF communications, anybody who's uh, amateur radio people use HF comms, shortwave radio. And basically, it, it works because a signal bounces off a layer of the atmosphere called the ionosphere, which is where the atmosphere is ionized, where particles are broken down, charged. So the, the waves go up into the atmosphere and they're bent within the ionosphere and come back down again. They then reflect off the Earth's surface and bend so you can get this multiple hop of um, the transmission and you can talk over quite long distances. Of course, it's not quite as simple as that. If you look at 
the ionosphere, sorry if this is getting too technical, but it's, I need to explain this. If you look at the nighttime ionosphere, it is simple. You've just got a, a simple, what's called the F layer, and you can just bounce off that. Simple, uh, simple bounces. This is why amateur radios like working, radio people like working at night, because you get good communications. You can get very long um, bounces, and you can talk to people long distance away. Once you get into the daytime, it gets more complicated because in addition to this band at the top, you get additional bands coming in, which are actually caused by some of the radiation from the sun. And so the extreme ultraviolet uh, radiation is actually exciting part of the atmosphere here called the D layer. Normally, it's not very strong but it can at times become opaque. And so this is an image that I, this, I took this about an hour or so ago of what the current conditions are. The sun is glowing at the moment. It's not actually flaring, or well, there's very small flares, but it's actually the, the background level is beginning to climb. And so the glow is actually causing a region of absorption which uh, it's strongest at the subsolar point. It's strongest at the point immediately <coughs> underneath the sun. And so here you can see that it was centered over the South Atlantic, but that was when I took it. By now it's probably over South America. So there's a general region where you've got absorption, which means that the, the communications, the high frequency communications could be degraded in that area. Now I was talking about the North Atlantic tracks. There are so many aircraft flying across the North Atlantic that actually have to have lots and lots of parallel air lanes which are stacked 2,000 feet apart so that the aircraft can move uh, and you get a, a steady flow of aircraft. As soon as you start having communications problems then what happens is you have to start spacing the aircraft apart so you can't have as many aircraft, you can't be as close together, you might have to separate them more vertically, separate them more horizontally. The consequence is the whole flow of traffic across the Atlantic can get delayed, it can slow down. You probably are not, when you, if you're sat waiting for your transatlantic flight, you're probably not told the reason we can't go is because the airlines are having to be spaced out because of the communications not very good but that may be a cause where you've got a delay. They can only allow a certain amount of traffic into the air lanes. And until the, uh, until the communications improve, they just have to live with that. Now, the, the effects of space weather are longer lived and over wider areas than typically for terrestrial weather. A terrestrial weather, you know, a storm, except when you get something as big as a hurricane, isn't necessarily very, very large and it's not very long lived. And so you can find your way around it. You may have to wait for an hour until a squall line of thunderstorms has gone past, but then you can go. But some of the effects caused by space weather can last for hours or days. Here I'm looking at a second effect where the, the communications are compromised and that's called polar cap absorption. The thing that I was showing here is where when soft x-ray comes, this will light up to be bright red, so you've got complete blackout. You can't use HF comms, and the reason you can't use HF comms is because this layer just becomes opaque, and so you can't get a signal through to bounce. Where particles, energetic particles, are involved, the particles tend to focus in at the pole. Because they're charged, they're affected by the Earth's magnetic field, and therefore they stream in at the pole you then get a region called a polar cap absorption effect, which actually covers a large area of the pole and radio blackout is complete. Now, when this sets in, it's not just hours. This can be days that this can last. There are flights which go across the pole. Only a few flights go across the pole. You've got to be geographically in the right place. So here, this is looking at flights from the eastern seaboard of the US over to Southeast Asia. This is a routes that were, in, were, were opened uh, after the end of the Cold War, so you can, you can fly across the pole. As you're flying over land, you're in VHF communications in the red. As you're over the 
oceanic part, you switch to HF communications. Above this white circle here, you have no chance of using anything else. That white circle is the limit that you can see a, a geostationary satellite. Below that, you can actually possibly use satellite communications. But above 82 degrees, you can't see the geostationary satellites. And therefore, you're only left with, with HF communications. If your HF communications are knocked out because of this uh, shortwave effect, then they can't fly over the pole. They have to reroute flights around the pole. And as I said, this is very expensive. They, there were talks when they, they put a figure together at the time of a set of flares in 2003, and they were talking about $100,000 to divert a flight. Now, that's not just the flight. There's all, all the knock-on effects as well, the fact that the, say the aircraft are in the wrong place and that sort of thing, and, and loss of cargo and things like that. OK. Now I'm going on to navigation rather than communications. Satellite navigation is becoming increasingly common. It gives you an accuracy of a few meters uh, over a very wide geographical area. And for aviation, it's replacing the expensive ground systems called VOR, which is a VHF omnidirectional radio ranger. And these are these sort of structures that you'll see on the ground. You may have seen, noticed them when on some airfield, you'll see one tucked away in the corner of the airfield, or you might see them as you're, you're coming into land. You've got these structures, but they, they have to be made all the way, maintained all the way across. And the way that navigation worked is that you fly from one beacon to the next. They're expensive. They have to be maintained. Everybody wants to go to satellite. But the satellite navigation systems, the, the Global Navigation Satellite System. And this is, this is the GPS. There's also, that's the American system. There's a system which Europeans are building called Galileo. There's a system the Russians put in orbit called GLONASS. And I think the Japanese have got a system. Maybe the Chinese have got a system. They don't have the accuracy to, um, and availability and integrity to support safety critical operations. And what I mean by that is if, if you are doing an approach to an airfield and the visibility is compromised, then you can't use, you can't just use GPS, GNSS. You can't just use GPS. You have to have something which augments the GPS. The satellite-based augmentation systems, and there are a number of them, the Americans call it WAS, we call it, Europe call it EGNOS, so there's various things. They basically use other information to make this thing work. I'll describe it in a moment. And then when you get to, towards the ground, you've got this ground-based augmentation system. GPS basically is all about timing. Um, you need to observe several spacecraft. But basically, the spacecraft know where they are. They know what time it is. You're on the ground. You may approximately know what time it is by observing several spacecraft. Assuming that the signal is traveling at the speed of light, you can work out exactly what time it is. And then you can work out how far you are from each spacecraft, which means since they know where they are, they're telling you where they are, you can work out where you are. That requires good propagation of the signal through the ionosphere. If there's anything that disrupts that propagation, then it causes problems. It means that you get uh, reduced precision in your normal GPS, etc., type systems. And the satellite-based augmentation system can also be compromised. The ionosphere, basically, the GPS is transmitting down from the ionosphere, and you're receiving the signal on the ground. It requires a good uh, signal. If you get any increases in density in the ionosphere, and this is, this is measured by something called the total electron content, but it's basically telling you how much ionized material is in the ionosphere. If you get any increase in, in density, that can cause the signal to bend, which means it's not following a straight path to you at your receiver, and any increase in path length is causing a delay, which means that you're not measuring the exact distance. You've got a delayed distance. So this is reducing the precision because each, each thing is, is potentially giving you a slight error. And then you have another effect, which is called scintillation. And these are called by small perturbations in the ionosphere. 
and the problem is it sort of scrambles the signal. Instead of getting a good signal through, it sort of breaks it up and so you don't get a good lock on your signal. You also get some effects which are um, caused, these are effects, this structure, you can see Africa poorly, Africa is there, America is there, Australia's over here, Japan's up there. These structures are related to the ionization from the sun. And so as the earth rotates, this whole pattern moves around. And so every day you get this lot sweeping past you. Um, this, this, is, this enhanced total electron content can also make it difficult to see through the ionosphere properly, which can compromise your satellite systems. Now I mentioned the satellite-based augmentation system. As I said, the GPS has this problem that you don't have quite enough integrity because you've got the ionosphere is not, not completely uniform. So what you do is you use ground stations to look up at the, this, the GPS spacecraft. You look at the quality of signal come from each spacecraft and then you compute by having lots and lots of um, receivers scattered around the ground, you can see what the ionosphere looks like. You can build up a map of the, the uniformity of the ionosphere. That map can then be uplinked to satellites in orbit. We use InMarsat. And that additional signal is available to the aircraft. And so using this augmentation, it says, OK, I see this position here. I think I'm here. But the correction matrix says that actually I'm a little bit further over here. By using the augmentation system, you take out the effects caused by the perturbations in the atmosphere. And that means you've got improved accuracy. And with that improved accuracy, you can do precision landings, even in bad conditions. And going on to my final effect, radiation. So the radiation effects, you know, you've got to consider them both offline and real time. The exposure to cosmic radiation varies depending on the location and altitude of the aircraft, the time in the solar cycle, and if there's any uh, solar activity. The, if cosmic radiation is affecting humans and the avionics, the exposure to humans can be monitored or modelled. The effects on the electronics, you should be able to design your electronics so they're not affected. So if you design it properly, select your components correctly, then hopefully your electronics, your avionics, are not going to be affected. Now, you remember the solar cycle where I was talking about the increased solar activity. The cosmic ray flux, the, the, the galactic cosmic ray flux, which is coming all the way from outside of the solar system, actually follows a modulation which is out of phase with the cycle. And so at solar minimum, you get a peak in, solar, in cosmic ray flux. The reason for this is that the amount of material inside the solar system, inside the heliosphere, varies according to solar activity. So when there's a lot of solar activity, there's a lot of material magnetic field in the uh, solar system, in the heliosphere, that blocks the cosmic ray flux, so the flux drops off. But at solar minimum, there's much less material in the, in the heliosphere, and therefore the cosmic ray flux rises. Because we had this prolonged solar minimum over the last few years, then in fact, the flux has been quite high in recent years. And then this may look complicated, but this is the Earth's magnetic field interpreted in terms of what's called a geomagnetic rigidity cutoff. It's, this is your friend. This, is, um, this tells you what level of radiation you're likely to get at different places on the Earth's surface. And so a low number is bad. You get high levels of radiation up in high latitudes. You get much lower levels of radiation over the uh, equator. In fact, if you fly from London to <coughs> Cape Town, as I did, that's actually a very low, low level radiation route you can actually see it because the, the cosmic ray radiation level just drops off as you're going across the equator and then climbs again as you get south of the equator. If you're flying from England across to um, San Francisco, you're actually flying through a very high radiation level route. And also if you're going from uh, England over to Japan, again, you're going through a high radiation level route. Strangely, there was a flight, if you look at the flights for Concorde, Flights for Concorde, which would go to Washington, 
apply directly on the contours. They're actually geomagnetically quite benign. So you actually got a dose flying across the Atlantic on corn cord, which was very high up, 50,000 feet or more, would be similar to the dose of flying over to San Francisco. Everybody expects corn cord to have a higher dose, but it's a shorter flight. It's actually a benign route. And so you didn't actually get it. You didn't get uh, the exposure. European airlines have been required since around 2000 to actually monitor the exposure of air crews to radiation. This is because it was decided that uh, air crews were the last remaining workforce that actually were really radiation workers but were not classed as such and therefore they brought in this legislation. <coughs> they have to uh, keep track of all of the, the exposure. It's supposed to be six millisieverts in a calendar year. Pregnant air crew is limited to one millisievert, or ALARA means as low as reasonably achievable, which usually means they ground the air crew. And this is implemented at a national level, normally using computer codes, but it's, uh, it means that the airline crews, they are fully aware of the exposure that the European airline crews are, uh, are getting. Some of the other countries, I think Australia adopted it, and I think the uh, Singapore Airlines might have adopted it. A few other airlines adopted this, but this was a requirement of the, the European um, group the Europe, uh, within Europe. So Europe, in fact, is ahead of the game of this. The American, the US carriers do not do this. Now, a significant fraction of the exposure actually comes from this slowly varying background. You've always got this galactic cosmoray, you only get a few flares, so you've got a significant fraction of the, the doses coming from those from that background. Responding in real time to an enhanced radiation level caused by solar activity is difficult. We, we have discussion in the UK in a group that I'm a, a member of where we say what should the airlines do if there's a big particle event and there's talk about all of the air aircraft coming down but you can imagine that flying across the Atlantic where you've got these hundreds of aircraft flying across at a time getting them all to come down in a controlled fashion when at the same time your communications are probably compromised because the x-rays from the flare are not knocking out HF communications it's difficult. There's air traffic control issues. So exactly how that will work if we ever get a very large flare, I don't know, but we're discussing it. So coming towards the end, um, there are limitations of what is possible. Even if the science is improved, um, along with issues related to how easy it is to get, you can get the data back in time where you can make sense of it, there, there could still be problems. There's a basic mismatch in what the airlines want compared to what we can give. When they're doing flight operational planning, they want to know, is there going to be a flare perhaps in the next 12 hours? We can only give them a probability that there's going to be a flare. We can't say exactly what time the flare is going to be at. And so they're wanting information we really can't give them. Um, it's hard to forecast in events, which so we can give good forecasts if, the, if an event has already started, then we can say, okay, hold on the ground, wait until something's, we know and understand how bad an event it is, and then take off. You may be talking about a 30 minutes delay, which is pretty standard sort of delay that you get. And as I mentioned before, flight times are actually quite long in comparison to the way things evolve on the sun. You can, uh, an active region on the sun where you can see all the flares going off around the sunspots that can evolve quite a lot in the time that um, you're in, in flight. And so something that is not flaring can turn into something that is flaring. And we can make predictions of the small regions of the ionosphere, which seem to work quite well. Um, we, can, we, we are overcoming those problems. They're changing the design of the satellites uh, so they've got dual frequency, which solves some of the problems, but not necessarily all of them. And so in summary, the impacts of space weather on the aviation industry can be significant, depends on the airline, where the uh, airline is based, how it's operated. The airlines in North America probably have the toughest problem because they're closest to the geomagnetic pole. Europe is generally less affected. The end of the Cold War had some interesting effects. You can suddenly fly places you couldn't fly before, but you're actually, you're getting more direct routes, but in fact, you're actually getting routes which are more affected by radiation 
and uh, effects on communications. The extent and duration of some of the effects uh, really cause more problems than um, terrestrial weather because they are so long. Um, and we can mitigate a lot of the effects, you know, either by the way that we do things, um, so we can solve most problems. Um, it's not as bad as it could be, but if we had a big event, we would have to work out what would happen. It could affect things for days or weeks. So I'll just go on to the next slide and um, ask if there's any questions. Back in 2003, there was a, a, a period of about two or three weeks uh, over Halloween, and so these are known as the Halloween flares. Um, there were two active regions which had a large number of flares. Uh, the Federal Aviation Authority declared that people, the airlines, should not fly at high latitudes, at high altitudes, and so they were rerouting aircraft, keeping them at the low altitude. Um, the trouble was there that by the time they got the warning out, there was another effect kicked in. What I didn't mention was that uh, a coronal mass ejection, as it sweeps through the, the heliosphere, it also blocks cosmic radiation. And so you, when you can sometimes go, get what's called a Forbush decrease, which is the cosmic ray background suddenly drops. So you got this energetic event, this warning came out after we got into this part where the radiation level was actually fallen below. So there's this issue about how quickly you can get the information, how quickly you can interpret the information, how quickly you can get the warnings out. Now, the doses that they uh, experienced were probably not very severe. But if it was a much bigger event, then it could be. Uh, when it's a similar time frame, the augmentation system, satellite-based augmentation system, completely failed because you're looking up at the spacecraft, your uh, G, uh, GPS, you're trying to map what the quality of the um, signal is. If at what happened at that time was they couldn't see the spacecraft properly, they couldn't assemble the map, they couldn't uplink the map, and therefore the corrections were not available. Anyway, another question? Is there a, uh, just a last question. Is there a fallback? Um, they, they want to take the VOR out, which means that all of the, the beacons that you used to use for navigating, and when you're flying around, um, certainly in Europe, you just go from beacon to beacon to beacon to follow an air route. If the beacons were still there, then you could fall back onto that, but they're likely to be taken out. Um, they are wanting to move to a system in Europe where air lanes are completely removed, in fact, Hungary has already switched to this. There, is no, no longer air, there are no longer air lanes across Hungary. And, but under this system, every airline would take the most direct route it could from one airport to the other. Um, now, that depends on good communications and computer systems that know exactly what's going on. And quite honestly, that scares the hell out of me with the, you get the space weather. <laughs> if you had a space weather effect like that, I just do not know how well that system would cope, but that, they want to do this in Europe because there's so many problems with the aircraft having to follow each other around. And you, you, know, you go some interesting routes back to London if you're flying in from Rome or something like that. You can go you know, way over northern Germany and that sort of thing, <coughs> just because that's the route that you're, you're sent on. Um. Um, the effect of the X-ray on the adoption of the D-layer, yeah. our experience has lasted for an hour or two, mm -hmm. our lab. You say it lasts for several days at the polar cap, high polar cap absorption, why? Well, at our latitudes, the soft X-rays follow the, the lifetime of the flare. It, the, the effect kicks in shortly after the, time, at the start of the flare. And uh, it, it uh, finishes after the flare is gone with a bit of time for the ionosphere to repair itself. Flares are typically, a small flare is typically a few minutes long, a longer flare is maybe an hour or so. But you also get the energetic particles coming from the shock front 
of the coronal mass ejection. And the coronal mass ejection is propagating through the heliosphere at probably a few hundred kilometers per second, but it could be as many as two or 3,000 kilometers per second. At the, at the, it can take, the shortest time is 17 hours, it can take days to do it. All the time it's doing that, there are particles coming away from these, which means that the, the signature associated with those particles is, com is flowing into the polar region all that time, so it can be days before it, um, it subsides. <laughs>